We're actually delighted to host for the very first time a lightning round table on South Asia beyond the humanities, celebrating the achievements and important work of our colleagues outside of the College of Letters and Science. Today's discussion in particular will focus on critical issues impacting South Asia and the global community at large, climate change, law, human rights, food safety and security, and privacy. What I'm going to do is very briefly introduce all of our esteemed speakers one after another, and then they will present a statement and opening um, some discourse for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we will open the house for discussion. Does that sound right? Yeah? OK. Um, so I want to start in alphabetical order with Dr. Sumulu Aptapattu, who is the director of research centers at the law school, and also the executive director of the Human Rights Program at UW Madison. She received her doctoral degree in international law from the University of Cambridge, and her area of teaching and research focuses on international environmental law and its relationship to climate change and human rights. In addition, Dr. Atapattu is an attorney at law for the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka. Our next speaker, Sundaram Gunasekaran Guna, is a professor of biological systems engineering and food science and director of the CALS International Programs. In addition to over 200 peer-reviewed publications, Professor Sundaram has produced over 10 patented or patent-pending inventions. Among his many professional honors, Professor Sundaram has also been awarded the President's Volunteer Service Award. Our third speaker, sitting in the corner actually, Dr. Sanjay Lemay, is a distinguished scientist uh, emeritus at UW Space Science and Engineering Center. Not only has Dr. Lemay dedicated his distinguished <coughs> career to planetary atmospheric research, he has also demonstrated a strong commitment to education and public outreach programs. He's currently a participating member of a joint NASA mission to Venus, um, chair of the International Venus Exploration Working Group, and president of the International Commission on Planetary Atmosphere and Evolution. His areas of expertise also include global warming and climate change. Parameswaran Ramanathan, Paramesh, sitting in the middle, is a professor of electrical and computer engineering and associate dean of UW Graduate School. In his role as Associate Dean of the Graduate School, Professor Ramanathan provides um, in institutional leadership for graduate education across campus and with the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education. His teaching and research focus on security and computer networks, real-time systems, digital systems, design, and fault-tolerant computing. So join me in welcoming this very distinguished constellation of speakers. Thank you all for joining us. So, do you want to go in this order? Yeah, if that's okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Venkat and Sarah, for inviting me here today. Um, so, um, as Venkat mentioned, I um, look at the intersection between environmental issues and um, human rights. So. Um, applying a justice framework to uh, my work. Um, I kind of feel like an imposter here because I don't technically work on South Asia. <laughs> um, I, um, my area is international law, but I'm very interested in South Asia because I'm from South Asia. Um, so um, I will talk a little bit about um, um, climate change and South Asia. And uh, if I have time, a couple of uh, uh, book chapters I did recently uh, that on South Asia, so I don't feel too much of an outsider. <laughs> uh, so uh, we are all talking about climate change these days, uh, and South Asia, unfortunately, um, is one of the most uh, vulnerable areas of the world. Um, and um, even as far back as uh, 2007, uh, the United Nations Development Program uh, recognized that already, and this was in 2007, uh, millions of people are already being, millions of poor people are already being forced to cope with the impacts of climate change. So um, the injustice of climate change is that the industrialized countries contributed most of the emissions 
um, that gave rise to climate change. And most of the impacts will be felt by the vulnerable populations in the global south. Um, to the extent that some of these countries are going to disappear at some point because of sea level rise. Um, so although we recognized in 2007 and the legal framework actually uh, goes back to 1992, um, we are lagging behind in uh, what we have, <coughs> what we should actually do to address the situation and I'm sure some of my colleagues might talk about uh, the scientific aspects as well. Um, so if you look at South Asia, we have, um, you know, no two countries are similar. We have a wide range of uh, states with wide uh, <coughs> range of vulnerabilities. So we have low-lying cities like Dhaka, Mumbai, Karachi. Uh, the entire coastal belt of Sri Lanka will be affected, not to mention, you know, changes in uh, weather patterns and things like that. Rainfall is already very erratic. Then we have a small island state as well, the Maldives, and they're already uh, feeling the impacts of climate change. Um, and then there are landlocked states as well, like Nepal and Bhutan. Um, so the, uh, the approach uh, to climate change within South Asia um, has to be different taking these geographical um, um, vulnerabilities into consideration as well. Um, so there are similarities, of course, the culture is quite similar, but you know, India is the world's um, second largest, has the second largest population. Um, it's all, politically, it's also playing an important role as an emerging economy. Um, and we have seen that in relation to climate negotiations as well. Um, so because of these diversities, it's hard to adopt, when we draft a legal approach, it's, it's very difficult because we have to take these diverse um, <coughs> situations into consideration. Um, so uh, the Stern Review, some of you uh, might be familiar, which looked at the economics of climate change in 2006, again, these reports are pretty old, um, said that from the Himalayas, which feed water to a billion people, to the coastal areas of Bangladesh, South Asian countries must prepare for the effects of climate change, even as they work to combat the human causes of climate change. Um, so the situation, because of the Himalayas, the glaciers are melting, um, the situation is not very nice, unfortunately. Um, and the review uh, continued that more than one-fifth of Bangladesh could be underwater by the end of the century. And there's advancing desertification, rising sea levels, <coughs> and worriedly, um, the situation with regard to migration is an issue. So millions may be forced to migrate because of these consequences. And with international borders, it is a particular problem uh, because, as some of you may know, uh, the legal framework does not encompass people who migrate across borders for um, climate-related consequences. Uh, you have to establish persecution based on political uh, opinion, um, nationality, uh, place of birth, and things like that. So with climate change, you cannot establish that. So there's no legal framework currently to uh, govern people who migrate across borders or who are displaced across borders uh, due to climate change. There may be some uh, interesting developments happening in the UN, but um, Currently, that's the situation. Um, so if you look at some of these consequences, there will be water shortages, and already some of these uh, consequences are taking place. There will be food insecurity, increased salinity because of flooding, uh, inundation of low-lying cities, um, soil erosion, coastal erosion, uh, increased incidence of disease and we are already seeing some of these consequences. Severe weather events <coughs> is another um, uh, consequence, uh, although you cannot say that these severe weather events are totally due to climate change. Climate change <coughs> is increasing the incidence of these uh, severe weather events 
as well as uh, their intensity. And uh, the IPCC, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a group of scientists study climate change, um, has very clearly said that, established the link between these severe weather events and uh, climate change. And of course, um, to uh, add to this, um, we have a high prevalence of poverty in our region. Um, so some of the poorest countries in the world are in our region. Um, there's high level of child mal malnutrition. Um, some areas are densely populated. And then um, there's conflict too. So um, there are religious differences, um, ethnic differences, uh, that can be exacerbated by the consequences <coughs> of climate change. So, uh, so that compounds the um, problem. Um, so I mentioned climate change uh, refugees. Climate refugees uh, is not a legal category and because climate change is not the only reason why people move across borders or within countries. Um, it's hard to find the numbers of affected uh, people who will be forced to move. And the estimates range um, between 20 million to 200 million by 2020, which is this year. Um, so whatever the number is, we are talking about <laughs> millions of people worldwide who will be forced to migrate. And think, um, Think of places like the Maldives. Where are they going to go? Uh, and that's not the only country in the world, uh, not the only small island state in the world. There are uh, close to 50 worldwide uh, who will be, um, who will have to be relocated, right? Um, and international law does not have, again, a legal framework. We, we have not faced a situation like this. So, we don't know what will happen to these entities um, called states um, at the international level. Uh, what will happen to the people? It's a huge humanitarian crisis. Um, and the legal issues um, have not been looked at either. So, um, so that's <coughs> the cheerful work that I do on a daily <laughs> basis. <laughs> um, and I looked at, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, climate change in Maldives. I did a, a, a book chapter recently. And what was interesting about the Maldives, and we hear about, you know, it's a sm small island state, it will be inundated. But what was interesting was that the political situation is exacerbating the problem. And we don't really think about those things in the context of climate change, uh, but, you know, we had, the Maldives had a president who was a champion of climate change, and he did a lot of work to bring uh, the situation um, to, the, uh, to the attention of the global community. And then the next president came and said, no, uh, we want economic development, right? Went to the extent of actually selling one of the tolls to Saudi Arabia, right? Um, so, so that's the kind of situation that people are dealing with. Uh, and then, um, because uh, there's so much emphasis on economic development of certain islands, the other island, people who are living, in, um, living on other islands are neglected. Um, so there are lots of political issues, corruption, um, and things like that that are actually exacerbating the issue. Oh. Okay. Um, the other uh, chapter I think was about the port city project in Sri Lanka. Some of you may be uh, familiar with that. I won't go into detail because I'm out of time. But if you are interested, we can talk about it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, it's my turn. I want to talk about something that's very important to all of us. In fact, every living entity cannot function without food. Right. <laughs> But having food is something, and eating food to live is another. And do you know millions of people actually eat their way to death? Because food safety is a major, major global crisis, 
and uh, South Asia and Asia <coughs> are no exception. Some of my comments are, are a little larger scale, but some of them are more specific to India because there's more data available on that. Uh, India dominates South Asia, as you know, in terms of geography, population, and uh, economy, and everything. Uh, so the things that we can learn from Indian situation probably can be extrapolated into the neighbors, perhaps worse than what we see in India. Okay. Uh, India is uh, definitely of many contrasts. Let me give you so the world's largest producer of many fresh fruits and vegetables, milk, major spices, and other staples. Second largest producer of wheat, rice, and the third largest producer of dry fruits, nuts, and tuber crops. World's five largest producer of 80% of agricultural produce, including cash crops. Yet, India ranks 100 in global hunger index. In fact, on this scale, India is actually the worst in South Asia. <coughs> Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, they're all better in global hunger index than India. It is really very, very sad to know that a country that produces so much dominates the global economy and have several Fortune 500 CEOs sitting right here cannot distribute the food they produce and make their country food secure. So food security is definitely a situation that really exacerbates the food safety situation. Because of the lack of food, lack of weather and food, people turn to things that they can eat, whether it is prepared properly or hygienically, or if it's safe or not. So this food security and food safety are kind of intricately united in a, in a sense, right? Um, the crisis or further compromise international pressure. So the path to development not exclusively about economic growth, jobs, and infrastructure, which it just seems to be working on, but clear and consistent food regulatory policy implementation in both the are imperative for growth and inherent responsibility, right? So I want to set the stage for food safety in the global scale. Um, uh, is one out of 10, 10% of the world population is experiencing foodborne disease risk every day. One out of 10 people and about half a million die out of food they eat to live. They die from foodborne illness, okay? And the most vulnerable groups are children under five and the elderly, of course, they are high risk groups. And uh, waterborne diseases, drinking contaminated water, kills almost a quarter million people just by drinking bad hygiene water. And India alone has 100 million foodborne disease burden. And it is expected to grow about 150, 170 million in the next 10 years or so. And this is, uh, economic cost is not as important as the human cost, but economic, economically we lose almost $100 billion worldwide, and in India is about $30 billion lost economic opportunity and revenue and productivity. Okay. Um, all right, so what do you think of, how confident are you about the food safety in the U.S.? Yeah. Pretty good, I would say, like, we are eating, we are not thinking about <laughs> this ever not. So what do you think about confidence level of food safety in India? Is it higher or lower? A yeah, survey conducted last year, in fact, last year, June 7th, or June 7th every year is a food World Food Safety Day. Mm -hmm. So let us keep that in mind. <laughs> the survey indicated that the confidence level for food safety in U.S. is 90%. India, 93%. Mm -hmm. So people in India are more confident about the safety of their food than we are here. <laughs> the reason for that is the information available here. The last 10 days, FDA has issued recalls, eight recalls of food in this country. Almost one a day. It, it happens every day, every month. <coughs> How many food recalls have you known of in India? I never heard of any recalls. 
In fact, there is a recent graph that says in 2008, there have been only 50 food poisoning incidents in India. <laughs> only 50, all of India. <coughs> and as of uh, 2017, it's only about 250 or 300. You can believe this. Right? This kind of poor and misinformation is a major cause for people ignoring food safety problem, taking food for granted, and using and abusing it. Not too long ago, you probably heard the, read the story about 25 school children dying yeah. eating a tainted lunch meal. And just last year, there were about 11 people went to temple, prayed the Lord, laid prasad, died. Food poisoning, tainted food. So people do not pay attention to preparing food and, and, and uh, uh, distributing and storing. So there's all reasons for food poisoning. But this does not happen only in preparation of food, even goes way back in growing. India uses, because of the water shortage, as you mentioned, we use wastewater for our irrigation wastewater for irrigation, nothing wrong, <coughs> but it has to be treated. Zero percent of wastewater used for irrigation in India is treated. We use sewer <laughs> wastewater directly. In fact, I'm leaving to India tomorrow to go to Madurai where over 30 years they've been using wastewater to grow crops. So I'm going there to help assess the contamination and bioaccumulation of heavy metals and toxins and bacterial growth in food. So when you source a food that is grown on wastewater, it goes down the line. And if you don't handle properly, if you abuse preparation and storage conditions, the situation only gets exacerbated. So number one country in the world that is guilty of food safety violations is India, of course. <laughs> India has been the most guilty based on the foods rejected at port of entry and shipped product. So food safety violations are horrific in India. It is not for lack of regulations. It is not for, well, <coughs> the government of India is upping the efforts to make food safe. But still, the infrastructure facilities are poor. Even worse is the corrupted politicians. So I want to read a, an article that was written by the popular Maneka Sanjay Gandhi. She says, last year I went to Belgavi, Karnataka to answer a frantic call for help by local residents who had uncovered a number of cold storage meat processing factories that were killing thousands of buffaloes illegally. The factory was not a secret operation. It was well-built structure and could not have operated the police were not part of the pay-up system. Local police commissioner was found to be part of parcel of this enterprise. First he denied there was such a factory, then he defended his actions. The cows were smuggled in from Goa and then slaughtered in a field. The dead animals were brought into the factory, cut them filthy meat package and export. I finally made the calls and cold storage found bodies and meat of 15,000 cows. This is in the country which we consider cows are sacred. And constitution denies or prohibits killing and slaughtering of cows. And India is the number one cow meat export. In the world. And Meneka County introduces a new term that I did not know. It's called meat laundering. Animals are slaughtered and illegally packaged and sold in international markets. Okay. So this is a sad state. I'm not sure how much time I have, but I do have a uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, David Letterman top 10 list of uh, adulteration foods in India. Number 10, ice cream. Most <laughs> common adulterants in ice cream are pepper oil and the ethyl acetate, butteraldehyde. These are all causing terrible diseases affecting lungs and kidneys and heart. Number nine, 
water and cream. Oh my God. But it can be diluted with water, partially replaced with cheaper plant oil, <coughs> such as palm oil, sunflower oil, and soybean oil. Number eight, spices. Turmeric using methanol yellow and red oxide lead. Soapstone or original material used in ink. That's the third. Number seven, dal. Most commonly adulterated dal is arhar dal, and usually adulterated with methyl yellow. Number six, honey, adulterated with molasses sugar to increase bottle quality. Number five, you like Indian sweets? Be careful. They don't have always have milk. They have starch, and the foil they put the shiny foil is supposed to be silver in order for the safe to consume. It's aluminum which is dangerous. Vegetables. What can they do with vegetables? <laughs> the bright colored textured vegetables are from malachite green and carcinogen. So if you think shiny fruits and vegetables, be careful. They're not shiny because they're good. Number three, wheat and other food grains. Wheat is very commonly adulterated with ergot, a fungus containing poisonous substance and extremely injurious to health. Number two, of course, chai, tea, coffee. And they use some uh, leaves. Tea leaves are usually adulterated with some colored leaves. Some might not even be edible. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee seeds are adulterated with the tamarind seeds, mustard seeds, and chicory. <clears throat> and number one, what do you think? Rice. Rice. No. Milk. Oh, yeah, of course. Milk is quintessentially the most adulterated product and of course water, adding water is very common. <coughs> Remember that King wanted every <coughs> citizen to contribute a jug of milk for his big uh, celebration and one guy thought, yeah, I'm gonna have a glass of water, who will notice? And then he opens the big gun and everything is water, no milk. <laughs> so adding water to milk is the age old story of uh, adulteration, chalk, <coughs> urea, caustic soda, skim milk. All kinds of things. So be careful, what you. <laughs> but again, <laughs> India is not alone. Milk contamination. If you read the um, what is this Poison Squad, the book, yeah. big red book, yeah. mm -hmm. it talks yes. about how bad it was in U.S. Yes. But it was in the 1930s. We have spotted up in this country, but not so yet in India, right? Mm -hmm. So 30% <coughs> of all the foods in India are intentionally adulterated, not by contamination. Intentionally adulterated. And situation is actually much better in the region, 75% in Bangladesh, okay? So these people are doing things that can cause long-term damage to ourselves. And we are not even talking about food getting spoiled even if you prepare well. Food is at its finest when you harvest. Once you harvest or bring the food, it begins to go down in quality. So even well-prepared foods can spoil. In fact, my research is based on that. But there is a lot of ways the food safety is ignored and food safety laws are clouded and violated in India. And uh, government is not doing enough. Uh, corrupt politician and bribery to circumvent these uh, rules and uh, lack of infrastructure and testing standards are causing. That has been increased awareness, but hopefully uh, we expect things can get better. I didn't want to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> Go to India, eat this luscious vegetables, and enjoy sweets, but be careful. Because they don't like the coffee, because they're so used to chicory. That's chicken. right. They try and, and, and cook in the United States to so try and find coffee that has chicory in them. That's right. Yeah, that's what they do. But you have you may be picking tamarind uh, seeds. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can stop. There is some transition, I suppose. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> last time. Uh, uh, this is a challenge for me. Uh, people have talked about uh, what they are doing on this campus. Uh, uh, and I've been here for close to five decades now. And most of my work has been uh, dealing uh, in observations uh, from space, uh, not just this Earth. Uh, but mostly the planets. So why am I here? <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> there, there are a few uh, connections. 
in space in India and this campus that uh, many people probably aren't uh, aware of. Uh, most of you were probably born after 1959 here, I assume, looking at the students, uh, certainly. Uh, so all of you have heard of uh, Sputnik, and uh, I don't know if there's any person in the world who doesn't know NASA, right? How many of you have heard of uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization? Uh, that's the agency that uh, was uh, actually now 50 years old, uh, last year, 1969, it was organized. And people are now beginning to uh, hear that name more often uh, because of uh, the changes that are taking place uh, in India, uh, despite the problems about food safety and climate change. Uh, but because uh, we have a very ambitious prime minister who is going to put an Indian space station in, the, in this decade. Uh, that's a new recent development. Uh, just two weeks ago, four Indian astronauts started training in Moscow first launch will be in 2022. So how did a country that still cannot manage infrastructure, uh, clean up sewage, take care of food safety, end up doing space? And this is a dichotomy that is uh, hard to understand, but there are some well-intended reasons behind it. Uh, uh, Sputnik was launched in 1959, and that created a uh, huge uh, shift in the education <coughs> policies in the U.S. I think the NASA uh, was founded uh, <coughs> sometime after that, I think it was a uh, year of 1961, I think. And prior to that, there was a, uh, uh, an act that uh, promoted science uh, and education <coughs> around 1960, something like that. But this was before my time in the US, so my learning and I forgot some of the history. So similarly, uh, the launch of Sputnik, I remember uh, uh, actually uh, looking for the satellite in the sky in 1959, because we heard there was something going beep, beep, every few seconds. Uh, uh, I was only about eight years old looking up in the sky. Didn't see anything, but it was there somewhere. I <laughs> uh, didn't know where to look. <laughs> there was a whole challenge. Uh, but that uh, provoked a lot of uh, uh, interest uh, in uh, countries around the world. Uh, recently, I was fortunate enough to attend the uh, 50th anniversary of uh, Sputnik uh, in Moscow, and uh, we were invited to this. Uh, State theater in Moscow, which can seat about 7,000 people. Uh, and uh, we were frisked twice. It was uh, worse than the airport security at the airport. <coughs> uh, and we were wondering if uh, uh, President Putin was going to show up. And it was in, inside the temple. Uh, but nevertheless, once we got inside, uh, uh, it was a very wonderful atmosphere. There was a uh, uh, Sputnik. And the audience was jammed back. And what they showed was uh, a movie which uh, you know, digressing a little bit about uh, Salyut 7. Now, most of you probably have heard of Apollo 13. Uh, this is the Russian Soviet equivalent of Apollo 13, Salyut 7 station. And then uh, it was a wonderful movie. If you get to see it, it's not distributed in the US, but it's, it's a wonderful movie. Uh, and after the movie, there was the huge celebration. There were all these beautiful generals with uh, uh, so many medals uh, on their chest, uh, they could probably fall over. Mm -hmm. And there was vodka. There was so much vodka I've never seen. <laughs> <laughs> That's besides the point. The Soviet Union and India had close ties. And so after uh, the uh, Sputnik, the Indian government, uh, actually, Department of Atomic Energy, formed uh, a commission called. Uh, in COSPAR, something similar to what uh, was uh, uh, in the U.S., the precursor of NASA, there was NACA, National Aeronautics and Civil Aviation, or something like that, NACA. And that was formed in 1962 in the Department <coughs> of Energy. 
uh, who was uh, at that atomic energy department was actually started by Homi uh, Bhabha, uh, a nuclear physicist. Uh, and uh, one of his uh, proteges, uh, Vikram Sarabhai, was responsible for uh, the creation of uh, Coast Park. I myself uh, had only a distant uh, view of Vikram Sarabhai. I was a uh, uh, summer intern uh, at the Physical Research Laboratory in 1968 in Ahmedabad. And uh, you know, young students, uh, what do we but across the, uh, in another building, uh, people pointed out, oh, this Vikram Sarabhai, and he had come on the weekend. Uh, and uh, he uh, started, basically, the space program. So uh, ISRO was formally organized uh, as a separate entity in 1969, and there was a separate Department of Space created. And something similar to NASA, the Department of Space is not a ministry. <coughs> it's a separate department. Uh, uh, and there is a secretary. Uh, but it is organized directly under the Prime Minister's uh, office. Uh, so the Prime Minister affects the agency a lot, and that has been good uh, throughout most of the Prime Ministers in that ISRO has um, managed to get uh, a, uh, all the funding it needs and can spend. And usually the case is that ISRO cannot spend all the money it has received. There are three things beyond that. And the early <coughs> uh, reasons for formation of ISRO was to essentially aid uh, in the uh, development of uh, the country's uh, uh, progress. You know, uh, uh, and there were two key areas. Uh, some of the old people, uh, I know, uh, I think uh, this uh, Professor Hasenrath, uh, I know he's been to uh, Pune, and he probably remembers the difficulty in making a phone call in India. Now these days, uh, you go to India, you know, which is a huge dichotomy. And it's been there for about the last 20 years. Uh, almost every person in India has a mobile phone. And this was true we about 15, 20 years ago. There are more mobile phones in India than in the US. There are about uh, close to 500 million mobile phones. And before the mobile phones, the only way you could make a long distance phone call was uh, using the technology that ISRO created for the country, and that was the development of communication satellites. Mm -hmm. And this is where the, the connection with UW comes in. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, have uh, uh, in close contact with uh, very influential uh, people in terms of what they created. Uh, the first one was Professor Rao in the Physical Research Laboratory, who later on became the chairman of ISRO, and uh, Space Week uh, named him one of the 100 uh, people in uh, uh, influential in space uh, throughout history. And another one was uh, Professor Werner Suomi on this campus, who is known as the father of weather satellites. Uh, Suomi invented uh, a spin scan camera that was flown on uh, a satellite in 1967. And that technology satellite, it was called Applications Technology Satellite. And the, once satellite index series 86, or it is F before launch in 6, uh, was a communications uh, satellite experiment. And that had a, uh, a novel experiment, the satellite instructional television experiment. Uh, and th there was a lawyer here who created the infrastructure for that, Edward Smith, he then moved to Washington. But that satellite was used uh, for transmitting uh, programming in India to villages and dis distant uh, remote sites. So uh, the Tata Institute has developed these uh, special three meter uh, antennas using uh, uh, this uh, uh, chicken wire uh, mesh, uh, uh, small. And I remember going to Ahmedabad the first time I was there. Uh, the, the first Earth station was uh, formed. So that was the beginning of history of communication satellites. And then at that time, uh, when I was in Ahmedabad, uh, there were uh, experiments uh, using airborne uh, uh, sensors, images basically, to uh, map uh, the land and figure out uh, uh, beginnings of GIS uh, that you, most of you probably are using these days. So those were the uh, two uh, drivers for ISRO. And for the, uh, since 1969 through almost uh, 1998, that's all ISRO with communication satellites. ISRO has launched and still owns 
more communication satellites than any other country. Uh, uh, but around the turn of the century, the focus changed uh, partly because of uh, the whole world was changing. Uh, number one, the, uh, nobody, uh, well, the uh, development of the mobile phones uh, destroyed or removed the need to have uh, a phone call go up to space and come down, and then you could have uh, cell towers on the ground. So uh, the telephone uh, went away. But then came the uh, home television sets, you know, satellite TV. So ISRO owns most of the transponders in the South Asian region. And then there is the natural resources satellites. Uh, many of you may have heard of Landsat. They used to map the Earth, and now these days there are so many private companies doing similar stuff. But Landsat still provides the <coughs> for agricultural uh, use for forest farming. And India developed those series of satellites, and then they went into radar. So that's the history uh, of the development. And then uh, in recent years, uh, the focus changed to doing science experiments. And it goes back uh, several years, and I should have mentioned one thing, uh, another connection. Monitoring weather. Uh, basically, monsoon <coughs> prediction is a big challenge in India because uh, for more than 100 years it's been st uh, statistical. So there was an experiment called Monix, monsoon experiment in the 1990s, I think, or late 1980s, you might uh, remember. Uh, at that time, one US weather satellite, geosynchronous, was moved over India. And that led to some interesting uh, situation because the laws in India did not permit any signal to be transmitted to the satellite and to be sent over to the US. <laughs> that required about uh, more than a year worth of uh, discussions between the State Department to resolve that. And there were similar other uh, challenges just with the Indian uh, uh, legal system. Uh, and some of them are still like Today. And that meant some restrictions on the distribution of imagery. You know, uh, it was impossible to find a decent map of India. And you still can't. Google has made the maps almost uh, obsolete. And that led to some changes in the Indian uh, legal system. And, and many of those uh, images are actually, uh, India does not provide them to Google, even though it, they have a higher quality imagery. But along these lines, the engineers and the staff became sort of dissatisfied with simply building communication satellites like an assembly line and launching them. And they wanted to do something different. So that's when they turned the focus to the moon, Chandrayaan 1. And then uh, some years later, they focused, uh, shifted the focus to uh, Mars and became the first country to successfully orbit uh, a satellite around Mars. They learned from the mistakes. I was there. Prior to the launch, uh, I mean, many years before, and so they were aware of the uh, mistakes that had taken place, and they had uh, uh, protected uh, against any such failure. So that was remarkable. Uh, uh, ISRO engineers are smart; they are comparable to any engineers uh, around the world. And now, I'm going over my time. Uh, ISRO now has announced a mission to Venus, which is my personal. Uh, uh, product of my negotiations and discussions for the last 15 years, and they'll launch in 2023. <coughs> Probably uh, they'll delay it to 25 when NASA launches uh, a mission to Venus, probably in the same time. Here. The one other development is the space station. Of course, they're going to launch some uh, astronauts uh, in two years, I think, and then eventually build a space station. And how that uh, proceeds is anybody's guess. It depends on uh, the will and the support of the government. The people are fully behind it. Uh, we'll see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know it's 1 o'clock, so probably. Uh, some people need to leave, but we're going to be here, so please. Um, I, I like so let me start. For those who are going to leave, feel free. Um, so just 
Vikram Sarabhai. I am fortunate enough to know Vikram Sarabhai, and I attended his daughter's Arigator, for example. And then because my dad, my dad works in BRC, Baba Atomic Research Center, and was one of the early employees along with Rumi Baba and so on. So, uh, so I have fond memories of Vikram Sarabhai and all of this. So uh, I'm going to talk. I have the thing that I'm going to talk about. I've, much less to do with any of these. I think these three connected to Southeast Asia a lot better than what I probably would do. But I'm going to talk about privacy, which again affects <coughs> all of us are influenced by privacy. Right. So, uh, of course, you see in press, popular press, two two kind of opposing things. Right. If you ask anybody, most people say they are worried about privacy. Right? But if you see their behavior. Nobody, I mean, cares about privacy. <laughs> and this, there is this dichotomy that exists, partly because some there are some misunderstanding about what actually privacy really means. What when you ask people whether they care about privacy, what they kind of mean about privacy is different from what they think of privacy when they behave uh, in a way that they are, don't care about. So, but that it, it is an area that has seen tremendous change in the last 10 years, right? Both here and across the world, right? Partly because of all the various technology developments that are there, right? And if you kind of think of privacy, there are three core notions of privacy. And this also creates this uncertainty about what it means, right? There is a social aspects of what privacy means. There are the legal aspects of what privacy is, and then there's a technological aspect of privacy. Right? Of course, my work as I'm a, an, an engineer and a computer scientist, and so I kind of work on the technology aspects of privacy. Right? And these three aspects are not at all well aligned with each other. Right? On the technology side, there are outstanding, I mean, excellent solutions for privacy. Right? You want privacy? I think there are. I mean, the research on privacy is extensive, and there are very, very good solutions to provide the privacy that anyone, anything that one needs. I'm going back to uh, 1980s, where some of the very big pioneering work was done, and some several <coughs> breakthroughs in the early 2000s. Right? And we have outstanding, uh, very, very good solutions for technology. But what technology thinks of privacy? doesn't quite match with what society thinks of privacy, and doesn't quite match with what the legal frameworks are. And because of this incompatibility, even the, it creates a lot of weird situations. So for example, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the European laws yeah. called GDPR, right? General Data Privacy Regulations, I think. Right? That kind of people think as the most <coughs> private see aware, most forward-looking privacy aware laws. And every country, including India, has its own privacy laws. Uh, fortunately, India is going to update. There are proposals to update these privacy laws that are more aligned with the European GDPR. But the world is a global space. A lot of the privacy and the data are global space. Don't care about the boundaries of the country. And if every country has its own privacy laws, it can never work. Right? I mean, you cannot say this is private here, not private there. You must store data here. You cannot send data from one country to other. You cannot say because the data moves without knowledge of any country boundaries. So what is fundamentally needed to solve the privacy problem is some harmonization of the legal framework across the country on what <coughs> privacy we want, and not only harmonization across the nations, and harmonization of that with what is possible in technology. A lot of things are possible in technology. And if we just kind of made the laws consistent with what is possible in technology, we may actually be able to do what the laws require. And that is the core problem that in privacy that we face. Right? So just to, I was going to do this kind of exercise, but given time, but maybe I just 
start one small thing and we will not complete it, right? Just to show you what is possible technologically, right? I have two volunteers, right? Maybe I pick two volunteers. I'll think of two numbers between zero and hundred, say. Right? And let's say two of you, right? You think of a number between zero and hundred, right? And suppose you want to figure out who has the larger number. Right? Who has the larger number? But you don't want to tell your number to anybody, especially not her. And she doesn't want to tell you her number to you. Right. But suppose you want to find out who has the larger number. Technologically, going back to 1980s, this was called the millennials problem. I mean, but uh, technology, there are solutions by which you can actually find who has the larger number without actually having to share with anybody. Right? You can think how you may be able to do how you could find who has a larger number without anyone in this room or each one of them knowing what the other number is. Right? Like that, you can actually do pretty much, you can show that there is any computation that you ever want to perform with data. You can do without having to actually reveal the data to anybody else whom you don't want to. Right? So there are technological solutions to deal with if we could just kind of agree on what it is. Right? And if you are involved in thinking about privacy, and when people say, do you care about privacy? Right? One kind of core thing you may want to think about is at least three or four things that you have to think about. Right? Who has the data? Right? Who are the party involved in whatever you want to manipulate the data with? Who needs the answer? You are going to manipulate. The manipulation is going to result in an answer. And who needs the answer? And fourth, who are you trying to protect the data from? Right? You say privacy. Who should not know the data? If you think about these four, and if you can clearly articulate all these four, then there is a solution <coughs> to do it. The reason the laws don't work with the technology solutions is because they don't quite articulate, or society doesn't work with they don't quite articulate these four aspects. Right? They kind of think like, well, I have data. I want no one privacy from everything, or every computation, or such general things don't work. If you kind of specifically say what it is, we can provide privacy data. And so, the, that maybe I given it is one ten. Maybe I stop here to give few people some time uh, to uh, if there are questions people want to ask. Okay. Anyone has a question? Who has the bigger number? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't tell you. I could. Uh, so actually, the way it was originally formulated was between Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. Who has more money? Who has more money? <laughs> I was going to use Bloomberg and Trump. But I thought, well, yeah, Bloomberg is clear. <laughs> of course, Trump wants to know, right? He wants to be able to say, I have more money than anybody else, without, of course, revealing his number to yeah. anybody else. And if you saw a debate yesterday, Bloomberg also was not as keen on revealing his taxes hero, hero. to anybody else. So they may be a perfect match for this example of the power. But very complex problems, very complex interactions of data can be done in a completely private fashion. Uh, Multi-party, multiple people and how it can be done. And we, of course, rely on the rights. Simple cases, I mean, we send credit card numbers, right? And we know, there we know who it is. I have a credit card number, who has the data? Who needs the data? My credit card company knows the data. And there we are typically preventing an eavesdropper from knowing, we don't care whether the credit card company knows my data. But even if we don't want the other party that wants the data, works with the data, if you don't want them to reveal, we can still provide technological solutions. Maybe there are a couple of questions. This was, I'm just going to not use my prerogative to compliment you all. I'll do that in just a minute. This was so fantastic. But let's take some questions. And maybe what we can do is collect a couple of questions. 
and then you know either one of you can address it. So.